welcome to another episode of Termite's Buzz, a weekly video game podcast where me, your host Termite, talks about the things I am playing, trophies I am hunting, some news of the video game industry this week, and wrapping it all up with a wonderful retro gaming discussion or talk about a specific topic. Thank you for joining me once again. You can find links to who I am and what I do and what I've been doing and what I'm up to over at 80bitpodsmash.com. That's our landing website with social media links to Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Instagram, Discord. Jump into the community. As always, we welcome your thoughts, comments, questions, concerns, and feedback. And you can do that by way of those social media platforms. If you are coming to me by way of YouTube and you're wondering what this audio thing is, every Monday at midnight, I drop a new episode of this podcast on all of the podcast services, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts. So thanks you for joining me. I am coming off of the cusp of a kind of stressful weekend. Uh, that was um, I was solo parenting because my wife gets a, a once a month. She signed up for a thing that she does out in the woods to learn survival tactics, tracking, foraging, and other environmental things, which is awesome. But that leaves me home with both kids, and we had a sick three-year-old that I was dealing with, so I'm a little heightened at the moment and feeling um, like very overstimulated and like I've given my attention too much whatever that feeling is when you've like given too much of att- of your attention to something for too long that's how I feel kind of burnt out I guess a little tired a little exhausted so uh we have kind of a lot of news stories but there are a lot of little little news stories to get through this week so I'm gonna start off of course with what trophies I'm doing and what I'm playing I had a little shake up which a positive shake up uh in that I've got so I <laughs> Trophies are a PlayStation thing, and I have been talking about my Frankenstein build that I have. Well, this is the first episode of the podcast where I've gotten my Frankenstein in from California, from Computer Booter, and have been... So that is a retro system that has trophies, and so now I'm stuck in this weird system where, like, if I want to talk about the games I'm playing and the trophies that I'm hunting at the front end of my show... That should also go into the retro discussion. So for this week, I'm going to save all of that for the retro talk. And so I'm just going to talk about PS4 and PS5 trophies and Nintendo Switch and newer games uh, for the trophies and current play- currently playing. And then if I have any PlayStation 3 or PlayStation Vita trophies to talk about, I will save those for the retro talk. I think that is a good way to kind of divide the conversation. I won't always talk about PlayStation 3 things in the retro space, but right now it's kind of, I'm inundated, so I'll do that. Um, I haven't really made much time for any other retro gaming stuff um, other than the PlayStation 3 things, but I'll get to save that, go to the end of the show if you want to hear about that, because it does involve PlayStation 1 and 2. Uh, what am I playing? So my main... My main game, I guess, like the thing I want to sink the most time into is still Hogwarts Legacy. And at this point, I'm 25 hours in, which I think was like two or three more hours since last week, which is showing you how excited I am to play it, which is not at all. And I finally just like bit my teeth, grit grit and bear it. Is that the term that we're supposed to use for these things? I saw there's a giant quest to get these little moon spheres for this guy. And you unlock the ability to unlock locked doors alohomora and you can there's three levels of alohomora and you have to do these moon stone fetch quest to unlock the third level of alohomora so that you can unlock every type of door like that's the strongest door so if you unlock alohomora level one and you happen upon a uh, level three lock you're out of luck so uh i wanted to get that done because i figured it was a foundation quest for getting other collectibles in the game so i followed a youtube video and got it all done, knocked it all out. That was fine. I did a whole round of side quests. Like, there's a little shield icon on the main map whenever there's a side quest to either pick up or turn in. So I just went around. I did all of the the flu powder stops, which is a trophy I got, uh, and just cleaned up all the a, a possible side quests I could do, except for the treasure maps. I'm going to save all that for last. Again, because there's, like, skills and abilities that I will unlock by playing the story, I wouldn't be able to finish the treasure maps right now if I wanted to, so I'm just going to save that till the end. But uh, it made me feel a little better. I think I can finally put a little bit of thoughts to why I feel so, like, not into Hogwarts Legacy, and it's kind of the same thing that happened with fallout and the witcher in that there's just so many things going on at one time there's so many different types of collectibles so many quests happening all at once and while there are quality of life things in the game to help 
help with that. Like you can fast travel pretty much anywhere. You can travel on a broom and fly. Like there's all these, like the waypoints are awesome. Like when you highlight a quest and it tells you where to go, like to navigate the castle and stuff. But there are other things that are not on the map that you have to do. Like the little pages. So you have, um, Revelio is a spell that like reveals the area around you. And there are these little floating, uh, parchment papers that you have to reveal with Revelio, and those are not on the map at all and there's no quest for them so you just have to do them and there's a little counter in the map that's like oh you've gotten 58 out of 120 or whatever and so uh you have all that going on as well as the side quest and there, that's only one type of collectible there's so many of them there's like floating books you're supposed to get there's like puzzles there's these rooms that have like mathematical puzzles that you have to solve there's like interactable statues scattered around there's all these little like secret passageways and stuff and so i just feel overwhelmed i think and whenever i'm playing hogwarts legacy it's just like i don't i want to actually like make progress and feel like i'm doing something but every time it's like a hydra you cut off one head and three more grow in its place kind of thing is how i feel and i guess it will get more streamlined as i progress through the game when i finish the story and i start knocking things out this is why i'm like slowly progressing through side quests now to kind of reduce the load of things at the end but i know i'm gonna have to follow youtube videos of like here's where the 200 pages are but i've already gotten 175 but i don't know which ones i've gotten and which ones i haven't so i have to follow the video for all of them kind of thing that's what's gonna that's what i'm looking at that's what i'm facing to get the platinum here so it's not difficult like there's no i'm not dying at all it's like not even a difficulty thing it's just so much here but the guides say it's anywhere from 50 to 80 hours for the Platinum, and I'm 25 hours in, so about halfway through the entire thing, which makes sense because I think I am nearing the end of the story already and just spending time doing all this extra stuff. So, yeah, that's my, once again, Hogwarts Legacy spiel. Um, so I had to switch gears. I had to take a break, take a step back. It's putting me behind in my trophy counts. I want that two Platinum a month rate of Platinum trophies to get, so I get 24 a year, and I'm woefully behind. I did not get to in March. In fact, because this whole segment is about my trophies, I should have already done this, but load my PSN profiles, and I will happily share with you all that I had received my one, two, three, four, fifth platinum for the year on the game on a game called Omno, which is a small little indie game that was free with PlayStation Plus that is very reminiscent of Journey in its art style and storytelling medium. But gameplay-wise, it's totally different. It's a puzzle platformer with no dialogue in it at all. There are lore books, and there are things to do in the game, and that's like collect orbs, log creatures that you encounter, and then, of course, solve the puzzles to go from place to place. There's 10 levels, about 12 to 15 collectibles in each level, and it went so fast that I started it Friday, and I platinumed it the day after, and I can't tell you how long, maybe three hours tops, like three to four hours of total gameplay time. Uh, a little fun game. The uh, the problem that I had with it is a problem with trophy hunting in general is that I spent so much time trying to figure out how to get it done as fast as possible by looking at walkthrough guides and videos that I compl- it completely distracted me from the game. So this is supposed to be like, you should play through it with no distraction first. Get a whole playthrough so you can ass- like assimilate, absorb the story, and be immersed in the world. Because it is a an artsy kind of indie title with great music. And it's supposed to evoke emotions. I think it's meant to be that. The ending, of course, is touching. And I didn't get it. I knew it was supposed to be touching based on the stuff that was going on. But I was so speeding through the game just to get the trophies that I completely detracted it. And I don't mind doing that for this kind of game. Like a a game that was was free on PlayStation Plus. It's good. It's not like one of those cheap games like Rattalika stuff or My Name is Mayo. So... I don't really feel bad about doing that, but if you're interested at all in the game Omno, go check it out. I think it was a lot of fun. There was some like a little bit of jankiness with the platforming, uh, and some mechanics that weren't quite ironed out. I don't think to the best that they could have been, but it's an indie title with a really small development team. It's like a not even an A. It's like a B or C budget game. So um, good, good for that. So I I'm excited. I got that's platinum number 94 and five for the year when I should have eight. So I'm still three behind. I'm looking to pick up uh, the next four-letter indie title that was free on PlayStation Plus called Toem, which is like a black-and-white photography game that also has a three- to six-hour platinum, and it's very easy. So I'm probably going to knock that out, and that will be one of the other low-hanging fruits. And then what belongs... No, what what happened? Edith Finch. What is the name of that game? 
Edith Finch. What remains of Edith Finch? So I got the Platinum on the PlayStation 4 version, but I have not played the PS5 one. So uh, that's also a pretty quick... That game's amazing, and I definitely absorbed that story and took it all in. I highly recommend that. It is a pregnant mom who is walking through a childhood house and experiencing the memories of her little siblings growing up and her parents and how she was treated by everyone in this house and it's wild uh totally totally where you like fill out the family tree as part of that's like what the game is each room each mission is like filling out the tree so that's published by annapurna interactive so just like the pathless it's awesome uh, i highly recommend that so once i get toem and edith finch that would put me two up and i'll be at seven for the year uh, and i'll still be one behind all of this is to get things done and check off some lists to get ready for Star Wars Jedi Survivor, of which I had finished. There's a book called Battle Scars, Star Wars Jedi Battle Scars, that documents what happens between Jedi Fallen Order and Jedi Survivor. And I finished that book, so I'm like really eager to see where the story picks up with Cal Kestis and his gang on the Mantis ship. Uh, so I'm excited about that. And that's on the 28th. I also am getting a switch oled model the zelda one that's coming out on the 28th and that's going to reinvigorate me to want to play some switch games for a little while leading up to the release of tears of the kingdom so i need to knock some stuff off to feel really good and comfortable and ready to rock for star wars and then of course zelda which will consume everything if you are a long time listener of 80 bit pod smash we've talked about breath of the wild so much in every single episode of our show that we've made it an inside joke that we're contractually obligated to talk about breath of the wild because it's so good and so i have all the same hopes for tears of the kingdom that it will be just as good if not better so that's what i'm currently playing that's what's going on in my world of video gaming other than the frankenstein playstation 3 which i will get to later so what's been going on this week in the news? I don't know what order these are in. I tried to stay in chronological order where I start from like the oldest thing and end with the newest. And I'm going to try to do that. So I apologize if that's out of order. And you probably wouldn't have even noticed if I didn't say anything. So I probably should have just kept my mouth shut. But I'm in a pod. This is a podcast. So if I kept my mouth shut, it wouldn't be a podcast. That'd be kind of weird. Don't you think? So the first thing, first bit of news, this should be really fast, but I thought this was incredible. PlayStation Plus may have finally stopped spamming you for claiming free games. This comes by way of Push Square, written by Sammy Barker, and if this is the way that it happens, I'm extremely excited. I don't know if you know this, but it is a, now I'm going to read the article. It is a problem as old as time. We like to describe it as the thank you for your purchase heart attack. We've all experienced it on at least one occasion in our lives. We hurriedly downloaded the latest PlayStation Plus games, checked our inbox an hour later, and felt the blood rush from our faces, thank you for your purchase, and felt we've been hacked. Of course, none of this had been hacked. It was just a receipt from Sony telling us we'd successfully claimed our free games. But that message has been the bane of PlayStation players for over a decade now, and it sounds like it's finally been solved. Reddit was the first to notice the alteration before it was picked up by PlayStation Lifestyle and shared elsewhere. So I remember when the PlayStation Plus tiered situation launched last June or July, and I was inundated with a whole library of tons of new titles because I had the premium, the upgrade one, right? So they have the, yeah, whatever the highest tier of PlayStation Plus. I was in there because I pre-ordered the whole thing and it like auto calculates your existing time. Anyway, it's a whole thing. I claimed like hundreds of games. I just sat in an airport like claiming game after game after game after game after game because I was waiting for a plane and I had nothing else better to do with my time except for maybe read a book or play my Switch or my Vita because I was playing Persona 4. But I claimed every one of them, and I remember my inbox having so many thank you for your purchase emails, and I knew it was me. I didn't feel hacked. But rewind the clock like four or five years and definitely had that like like in your gut. I got hacked. What happened? You check it, and you see the game that you got from PlayStation Plus is $0, and thank you for your purchase. Well, all of that, no more, and I'm very excited about it. So thank you, Sony. That was pointless and silly. Shouldn't have happened to begin with, but here we are. I feel like Sony's the king of that. Why are we here? But here we are. Like, thank you for doing this, but you should have done it a long time ago. And I'm looking at you, Xbox Live versus PlayStation Network in 2006. Okay. State of Play came out this week all about Final Fantasy 16. speaking of Sony. And now I'm going to read uh, some stuff 
from IGN's article written by Adam Bankhurst about it. So a brand new PlayStation State of Play has arrived, and it was focused entirely on Final Fantasy 16. We already know it is set to be released on PS5 on June 22nd. So this presentation was all about learning more about the game's world, spectacular Akon battles, combat, base camp, and more. We're here to break down the big news from the State of Play. So I'm going to skip the content about epic battles of Akons because I think we've seen that a lot. Um, if you care at all about what's going on, I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of detail here because just go watch the state of play. If you are, I know a lot of us are on blackout. Like we don't want to know anymore. So I'm just going to say what the state of play showed off, not the details. Uh, Clive's hideout is a base camp filled with characters, side quests, shops, and more. Um, there was, where's the whole thing about the skills. I wanted to like other people's writing. This stuff is way better than I'll ever be. So I like to just read what other things, what other people have said. But, okay, so it showed off a little bit of the skill tree systems and, like, when you upgrade, when you kill enemies and you collect points, you can spend them on upgrades for your main character. It showed a neat little feature that you can auto-spend those points if you don't want to think about the details. Showed off some accessibility things. You can really crank down the difficulty if you just want to care about the story. In fact, when you start a new game, you can choose story or uh, battle-focused and, of course, the battle director is the same director from Final F- or, um, from Devil May Cry 5. You only ever control Clyde, the main character. Occasionally, you'll have NPC support, and you'll have two people in the fight, and you can issue commands. So I'm guessing that's like Final Fantasy VII Remake, except you can't switch to actually control them. You just can issue commands to them, uh, which, I yeah. Um, so that sounded fine. That was really cool. I showed off different areas of the world, different biomes across the map. The loading times are amazing. Uh, it, it was a really good showcase. It showcased the graphics walking around free roam. Uh, it's more like open zone kind of final fantasy 10 esque where it's like, here's this big and 13 to some extent, Final Fantasy 13 and 10, like how you traverse the world is, is very reminiscent of that. So lots of cool things to look at. If you care at all, please go check out the replay on the final fantasy 16 state of play, but it's good. The game is gold. It showed, showed it, it showed like you can see this game is done. You can see it's quality. It's going to be good. It's going to be a heavy hitter. Uh, I'm excited about it. I think it's going to do well. Unlike this next news story, Redfall won't have 60 frames per second mode on Xbox at launch. This article comes by way of The Verge by Jay Peters. Redfall, which is set to be one of Microsoft and Bethesda's biggest Xbox releases of the year, won't have a 60 frames per second performance mode on consoles at launch, developer Arcane Austin announced on Wednesday. It said the game will be limited to quality mode, that is 30 FPS frames per second at 4K for Series X, and it's at 1440p on Xbox Series S. The announcement is disappointing, especially so close to the game's Nearly there, May 2nd launch date, and when previous footage has been in 60 FPS, Redfall looks like it will be a decently fast-paced shooter, and I'm worried about the 30 FPS limitation on Xbox will make the game feel sluggish. And personally, I always pick higher frame rate over higher graphics quality anyway. So there's that. Another misstep, yet again, from a Microsoft studio. I feel like Microsoft is stepping on rakes everywhere they go, and they cannot catch a break here, and this is yet another one. I remember there were being some there. I remember there being some kerfluffle about Redfall having and having to be online all the time, even if you're playing single player. Uh, and I've heard some other uh, critiques on the game that seemed like if they were to just delay it and fix this and get it out properly, it would probably do better. Uh, it needs to do good. Like Microsoft hasn't had a big hitter since Forza Horizon Five and Halo Infinite, which Infinite was like it, great at first, but like infin- infamously misstep after misstep. Uh, cutting out all split-screen co-op entirely, uh, the campaign not being supported online co-op forever, and dropping super late uh, into like the battle pass model, no content. I mean, like Halo Infinite really came out the gate strong, and then at three months or so later, it was trashed like toast. Uh, as far as like reaction, I think it's great. We played it for a while. I had a long legs for me. I played it a lot. I still kind of mess around with it occasionally, but. We're talking about masses, we're talking about player counts, we're talking about adaptation, engagement, uh, how much money it makes, etc. Of course, we infamously know that Games Awards, what was I going to say? Microsoft was completely absent from the Game Awards last year, if I recall. I remember Phil Spencer being in the audience, but not a single game from an Xbox studio was mentioned. And then there was the developer showcase where Hi-Fi Rush had come out, was announced and released that day as a shadow drop, which was amazing. Uh, absolutely incredible, and that was a good thing for Microsoft, but we're talking like a two-year drought here, and we know that Microsoft has spent an absolute mess ton of money 
on studios over the last five or six years. They have acquired so many studios. We know that there are games out there, Everwild by Rare, Avowed by Obsidian, Perfect Dark by The Coalition, Where is Senua's Hellblade, Senua's Sacrifices sequel, which I can't remember the name of right now, from Ninja Theory. Uh, Where are all these games? What is going on? What's next from Double Fine? We know Forza's coming this year, Starfield, Redfall. That was it, right? All this stuff's supposed to come out. What does this mean for Starfield? Is Starfield going to have a frames per second limit on it as well? Like, this stuff might not seem to matter very much to a lot of folks, but there's enough here that this is another misstep. It's another piece of bad news um, that I think they should just delay it and fix it and come out with a content complete game uh that doesn't have to be online all the time to play but that's just me so my fantasy critic league is taking some hits this is one of two hits this week uh i had redfall slated and i don't think it's going to review well now that this mode has been pulled so that's one hit on my fantasy critic the next one is suicide squad kill the justice league has been delayed polygon nicole carpenter writes rocksteady studios delayed suicide squad kill the justice league Let's follow up to the Batman Arkham franchise to February 2nd, 2024, which was announced on Twitter. We have made the tough but necessary decision to take the time needed to work on getting the game to be the best quality experience for players. In March, Bloomberg reported that Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League would be delayed, but still be released in 2023. Rocksteady Studios expected the game's launch on May 26th after an earlier delay that pushed Kill the Justice League from its planned 2022 window. Bloomsburg report came after the Rocksteady previewed Kill the Justice League during a State of Play presentation in February, one that didn't exactly impress. So if you remember that State of Play happened and the news feedback, everyone's reaction was poor. Uh, What is this like superhero third person shooter with flying abilities? Because that's everything looked the same. Uh, was the biggest critique, uh, it being online all the time, battle pass integration, loot systems that looked like it was Marvel's Avengers, like what's happening, was the feedback, and apparently they're listening to that. I don't know how much of it they're going to be able to change between now and February of 2024, but I am all for delays. It's one thing to have a game delayed. I understand that it's bu- you can be bummed out. You might plan ahead for it. You might have friends from out of town getting together for the first time in years. You might have... Uh, you plan to take off work or like get a, a vacation away from family or friends or whatever to go play a game. Whatever plans you have around games that people make around video games and their release dates, I understand that like a delay can really frustrate those things. But I don't know if and you can educate me, please, if I am wrong. But I don't really know of any other reason why anyone should be mad about a video game delay other than like concrete plans that involve your job, your family, or your friends' lives and traveling. Uh, would be a bad thing. Like, video games that are delayed are always better. Like, delay them and get them to come out correctly. Imagine how much the cyberpunk conversation could have been changed if the game was delayed another six months, however long it took them to, like, re-release the game. Another year, even. Now, um, that's on the consumer side, obviously. Everything what I just said about, like, being mad about games being delayed, that's all on the consumer side. If you are in the mar- stock market, if you're investing in companies, if you are a shareholder, if you are a stakeholder, if you are in the games industry at all and have any stake financially in the company, that's where you have a reason to be mad, frustrated, or upset about the fact that games are delayed because when you cash in a game, the return on that return on investment figure that you've planned for is the sale of the game and the player interaction of microtransactions therein. So I get it. You, you're, you push a game out, you're pushing your return of investment out, and most of the time, because you miss hype windows or you push the game into the release area of other big titles, competition, competition can be worse, and player engagement can be lowered, uh, and charisma engagement, whatever you want to call it, hype, zeitgeist. I don't know why I said charisma. That's a person's trait, not a video game trait, but you know what I mean. Like the hype around it's diminished because it's late. Maybe. Or you have to revamp your entire marketing cycle, which costs more money. And so therefore it's even worse. Anyway, I'm rambling now. So um, Suicide Squad, Kill the Justice League, delayed into 2024 is another hit to my fantasy movie. Movie. Woo, you see? I am so, so ingrained in I was so ingrained in the fantasy movie league when it was alive before the pandemic that I just want to say fantasy movie league whenever I say the word fantasy. No, the fantasy critic, which is the video game producer fantasy league that I'm a part of with the flock. And this will hurt my score because it's now not coming out this year at all. So whatever points I was going to get on the review, I get nothing. And it's a slot in my lineup that cannot be replaced. So I'm stuck. And I'm not the only one in our league that has had this happen. I don't remember the other game. I think Penguin got stuck 
with a game that was delayed out of this year. So there's that. What's next? The Super Mario Brothers theme music is the first game music selected for preservation in the Library of Congress. This isn't a huge video game newsy thing, but I was really excited about this. Koji Kondo's music joins more than 600 other culturally significant sound recordings. So Chris Scullion over at the Video Games Chronicle writes, Since 2022, the library has been maintaining the United States National Recording Registry, a list of sound recordings that are, quote, culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant and or inform or reflect life in the United States. Every year, 25 pieces of music are selected to be added to the National Recording Registry, which means they will be preserved in the Library of Congress. This year, Koji Kondo's main theme for Super Mario Bros. is one of the 25 chosen, marking the first time a piece of video game music has been added to the registry. Other sound recordings chosen for inclusion this year include Imagine by John Lennon, Stairway to Heaven by Led Zeppelin, Take Me Home, Country Roads by John Denver, Like a Virgin by Madonna, All I Want for Christmas is You by Mariah Carey, and Sweet Dreams Are Made of This by... Eurythmix, I can't even say that name, Eurythmix, Eurythmix is probably right. So yeah, that's pretty freaking awesome. And I remember at the onset of this podcast, like six years ago, I was kind of one of one of the many inspirations I had for even doing the podcast was cultural relevancy and validity of video games as an art form. Uh, and this is it, right? The Super Mario movie has come out. It has set tons of records. It has outsold a lot of Disney movies for its setting records as far as like how many days, how many release weekends, how uh, there's so many different like statistical figures of movies, which I'm familiar with because of the fantasy movie league, Mario bros, the movie, the super Mario bros movie has broken a lot of records and it is still going strong and it's awesome. Um, so I'm glad that it's doing well. That's one aspect of like, finally a video game adapted movie is making big mainstream money, big mainstream attention like it's getting there right there wasn't when i was a kid there were no mario underwear in walmart like there wasn't shaped candy tins for zelda these things didn't exist video games were still niche i was a nerd for playing video games or at least talking about it when every kid in the 90s was playing nintendo or sega and for some reason no one was talking about it at school except for the nerds come on kids come on jocks You've seen Mean Girls, all of the categories, all the categories that didn't talk about video games. Anyway, I was excited about the fact that video games are becoming more relevant and culturally mainstream, and I wanted to continue pushing the ideas of talking about topics in the world around video games. And that was the inspiration, part of the inspiration for 80-Bit Pod Smash. And so here it is, another blip on the validity radar. Just like, I feel so validated that Mario music is getting put in the Library of Congress. What do you say now, parents? I was just rotting my brain, staring at the TV, ruining my eyes. Yeah, where are we at now? We got Mario in the Library of Congress. That's pretty it's pretty awesome. And the last story that I will talk about is a new Zelda Tears of the Kingdom trailer dropped this past week. So I'm going to read a little synopsis by Logan Plant. I'm going to take the same approach I took with the Final Fantasy 16 say to play. A lot of y'all folks don't want uh you want media media blackout you don't want to know things so i'll just say like things that were showcased off but i won't go into too much detail this could be a potential or a potential spoiler for you if you care just like skip forward by like a few minutes because i'm going to start off with one that's probably the most risk for offending someone who's really trying to stay out of the spoiler so i'm gonna give you a second and you can skip one two skip away All right, so the first thing that was shown off, or at least one of the biggest things from this trailer that was shown off, was your first look at Ganondorf, the Gerudo King of Evil. He is returning. So the Link's nemesis Ganondorf finally shows up in the trailer. We see him early in the trailer, staring directly into a blood moon. Then later on in the trailer, a new rendition of Ganondorf's theme kicks in, and we see the iconic villain from the front. Nintendo of America posted his quote from the trailer, which is, Do not look away. You witness a king's revival and the birth of his new world. Uh, it was also later revealed that Matthew Mercer voiced is voicing Ganondorf, which is pretty dope. He's from Critical Role, and he does like Legend of Vox Machina, and he works with a lot of cool people in the game industry voice acting space, such as Laura Bailey and Ashley Johnson, who played Ellie and Allie. No, wow, Ellie and what is the main character in Last of Us Part Two? Oh my gosh, that's not Ellie, but the other one. Abby, thank you, mind, for that delay. Anyway, um, so that happened. 
There are all kind of other teasing things going on. You can see um, the objects that look like, quote, tears, like Tears of the Kingdom. Um, Zelda sporting a new haircut, new jewelry. Uh, you can see the, the shot where Zelda's holding the Master Sword. There's so many things that like you can look through. I've watched this thing like 20 times. I'm freeze-framing. You can see the scene where like Link's arm with the Master Sword is getting corrupted. Uh, so there's a lot of cool things in here to go check out. There's no new mechanics showcased. It's more or less just story and content, theme, and music kind of stuff. Um, it's absolutely phenomenal. It was, it was the one trailer about Tears of the Kingdom finally that got me to like really be out of this world excited, like goosebumps. I had to watch this thing several times. Oh, like I said earlier, I'm watching like cross-reference videos where it's showing the world of Hyrule compared to Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. So I'm in. I can't wait. I'm going to get this new Switch OLED model. It's going to be my little handheld. I'm going to take it everywhere, and I'm going to play the crap out of Tears of the Kingdom for so long. I don't even know because I only have you know a few months before Diablo 4 and Final Fantasy 16 hit, and then my summer's over. Like That's going to be it. Three games for the whole summer. Um, without even looking at a list of the other cool things I want to play. So, Tears of the Kingdom looks really, really good. Go check the trailer out, if, if at all. And if you had skipped for spoilers, you can resume, because I'm done talking about that. And that is the end of my news segment. I can't believe I got through all of that, my intro and my trophies, and I'm only a half hour into the show. So I'm really sitting here with the target of, like, I wanted to keep it from a half hour to an hour, 45 minutes or so. And here we are. So... I got my Frankenstein PlayStation model in. If you don't know what that is, if you're first time hearing about what a Frankenstein PlayStation 3, the gist is that they took a, a had computer booter, harvest a graphics processor off of a newer piece of revisioned hardware for the PlayStation 3. So they came out with a slim model and then later a super slim, but specifically I got one from a slim, harvest the graphics chip out of a PlayStation 3 slim and graph the processor onto the main board of the launch model PlayStation 3s. And why would I do this? It's because they're backwards compatible and you can play PS2 games on them because they have the PS2 graphics and processors on it. So there's four chips on this board, two for PS2, two for PS3. And they're becoming more and more hard to come by as they all are destined to fail. All the launch models that have a 90 nanometer RSX, that's the specific type of graphics chip, any of those, they're all going to fail given the uh, limitations that were engineered. It was an oversight. There's a whole like story around the whole thing. I'm not going to get into that right now, but you can go do some research. Uh, follow me on social media because I have posted all kinds of things about it. Uh, so I had sent the PlayStation 3 off to California to Computer Booter, who performed it over the internet or on the internet live, and I have links to all of those available. They have been posted on my social medias. You can get them at any waking moment. I'm extremely excited to share all of his stuff, especially working on my specific PS3, but I got it back. And here it is right next to me. It, this is an audio only thing. So when I say here it is, it's right next to me. The, the, I'm like looking at it and waving toward it, but like that's it. I understand you can't see it, but it's here. It's on my desk and it fully is fully functional. It works. Everything about it works. I have run through the gamut of playing PS1, PS2, PS3 games on it just to test everything out. All the different types of discs. PlayStation 1, of course, has one type of disc. It's a CD-ROM. It's a black backing and yes, it works. But PlayStation 2 has two different types of discs. There's a blue backed CD-ROM and a silver bottomed or silver backed uh, DVD-ROM. Both of those work and all of the PlayStation 3 Blu-rays work. And I have been rotating through a bunch of fun stuff. So for PlayStation 2, uh, I really, really want to play Dirge of Cerberus. And so I think I started to fire it up a few times, but I haven't sunk my teeth into it yet. But that's like on deck for like true retro gaming. It's the one Final Fantasy VII story that I have zero zero idea. I don't even know what to expect. Like I knew Crisis Core was about Zack and this... And I knew that Crisis Core was kind of a prequel. So Dirge of Cerberus is a sequel to Final Fantasy. And it's interesting because there was like Final Fantasy VII Advent Children, which is A. And then there was Final Fantasy Before Crisis or something as B. And then Final Fantasy Crisis Core is C. Final Fantasy VII Dirge of Cerberus is D. So it was like going down the alphabet of Final Fantasy VII content. I thought that was interesting. And the naming conventions that we all just kind of roll our eyes at actually have some meaning behind them. But anyway, uh, I want to play that. I haven't really touched it yet. What I've been playing, I finished my playthrough of Dead Space. That was the thing that took the most of my video game time over this entire week. I played through the rest of it. I think I was only in like chapter two of 12 when my last PlayStation 3 time was done. 
uh, when I decided to send this PlayStation 3 off to get Frankensteined, I decided to just wait on all PlayStation 3 stuff until I got it back so I could play it on this console in order to get as much use in the six-month warranty window as possible. So I've been doing stress tests throughout the week while I'm working, which is where I put Last of Us Part 1 in and start the prologue. Something about the very first scene with Sarah standing in the bedroom next to a mirror with a shadow of her cast on the wall really really hits the cell processor really hard and ramps up the temp- temperature and the fans. And so you can just leave it there and I leave it on for an hour and then I turn it off and let it cool down for an hour. And I have a little timer on my phone. I just kind of set it throughout the whole day. It's also a good reminder to like break up my work day and like stand up and go take a walk and like do other things as well. So just having like a repeated timer on is actually having a lot more benefits than I thought it would. So, uh, yeah, dead space was amazing. Not only did it, it, it Okay, by modern computing standards and by modern consoles, the the frames per second is trash. It's like 7 to 25 and 30 only if you like look at a wall. That's that aside, the graphics did not, did age well. They're fine. They still looks good. There's still awesome shadows. It's really low resolution, so a lot of jaggedy edges, not a lot of anti-aliasing going on there. And the animations are great. The voice acting's fine. The facial animations are definitely dated. But this is nothing like going back to an N64 game or a PlayStation 1 game where you're just like, potato, this is awful. So Dead Space really holds up. I wanted to play the original before I played the remake so I could appreciate the remake more. And I don't have a copy of the remake yet, but now it's on my list of like, I need to play this. So uh, I really appreciated Dead Space. The atmosphere was like combining Doom 3. And if you remember a video game about the Chronicles of Riddick, Escape from Butcher Bay, something about the vibe of Dead Space was just like taking all the best things from Doom 3 and then all the best things from Escape from Butcher Bay and putting them in a new game where you're like alone in a ship and it's falling apart and all this stuff happened. And I love like the intrigue that goes on. Like you always find out that it's not just as it seems, right? There's this invasion of creatures, but what is the creature? Is it an infestation? Is it a summoning of demons from another dimension? Is it something from another planet? Is it aliens? Like what is this? And you find out there's like an artifact and like, people are involved and companies that are corrupt like did some shady things and then like you have a church that's involved and like did some shady things and you find out like all these cool twists and turns and there is a big plot twist at the end I won't reveal but if you haven't played Dead Space it's really really good it's super fun and I imagine the remake captures all of this stuff just fine so you can go see it in a modern setting as far as like video games are concerned for PlayStation 5 Xbox Series PC what have you um so I finished it. It was good. I'm not going to platinum it because there's an impossible difficulty run through that I have zero interest in doing. I'm not trying to play this game forever. I love these like, and, and this kind of sets the tone for what I'm doing with my PlayStation 3 game library right now is I'm looking at some of the smaller campaign titles that I have because a lot of games back then in the 2006, 7, 8, and 9 specifically had like these multiplayer modes that were shoehorned in. If you remember, you had to like, there was an online pass code that was in the box so it was encouraging consumers to buy a new copy physically from a store sealed so that you had a code that was valid that allowed you to play online for free and this is why like i was just made that comment earlier about like microsoft xbox live versus psn so psn was free xbox live you had to pay monthly for and that was the big like debate well playstation network's free well playstation network was also like feature barren versus xbox live uh it was clunky to fall into a party with friends to like keep track of each other between rounds and games and you couldn't like jump game between games together cohesively as as you would because like each game you set up a party it was a whole mess in fact so much that i didn't really do it much and probably just misspoke on some of the features because it was not good so if you remember, you'd buy a game new, it would come with a little code, and it would be online. A multiplayer pass. Get your online pass. EA was notorious, Ubisoft, they all did this crap. And so you have a game like made for single player, like Dead Space 2, and there's a multiplayer pass. You're like, what is this? It's like a shoehorned multiplayer mode in. Which, that's the bad thing that happened back then. The idea was just to de-incentivize folks from trading games in or de-incentivize consumers to buy a used game in order to kind of combat the rising market of GameStop at the time with all the trade-ins. There was no way they could get a handle on that back on the PS2, GameCube, and somewhat of the original Xbox models because people were trading games in and buying them constantly. And when you do that, publishers and developers don't see a dollar, a dime, or a cent of that money. It all goes to the retailer, which would be GameStop or Funko Land or EB Games or whatever used game store you would go to. So Sony and 
I guess mostly Sony with the PlayStation side, like didn't want to lose that money. So they tried to capture it all by forcing these multiplayer modes in and intriguing consumers to buy them new. So they would have to pay an additional $10 to get access to online modes. They also put trophies into the multiplayer side of things. So really it was like the first paywalling of trophies. If you bought a game used, you didn't have a code to get to the online stuff and you had to pay money to access your online trophies or to even get them. It was awful. So because of that stuff, I don't really care a lot about PlayStation 3 Platinum trophies. There are some more approachable than others, of course, but the PlayStation 4 and PS5 library has an infinitely more list of games that are approachable for a Platinum that are actually serious and good. So that said, what I plan to do with my PlayStation 3 Frankenstein is to play through a bunch of PlayStation 3 games that had campaigns that were kind of short, like shorter than 10 hours. I have two Medal of Honors. I have a bunch of Battlefield games, Battlefield Bad Company, Battlefield 4, Battlefield Bad Company 2. I want to play through the Call of Duty games that I've never played before, so like Black Ops 1 and 2, World at War, and I have other games like Max Payne 3. Uh, I would like to replay Bioshock and Bioshock 2, Bioshock Infinite. Uh, and I, so these games are all like shooters and they have campaigns that are kind of short. Uh, and then I'd also like to revisit some of the older titles I want to get more trophies in like heavy rain and LA noir would be fun to go back and revisit. Um, so yeah, I got uh, mafia two. I'm looking at my wall over here. Uh, I'd like to actually do a playthrough of grand Turis- grand theft auto four would be fun. I've never finished four. In fact, five was the only grand theft auto. I actually finished all the way through. I can play grand Tur- or grand theft auto three vice city and san andreas on ps2 on this frankenstein so that's also some more possibilities and then if i feel like getting into more meaty games i do would like i would like to play new vegas for the first time and then uh, the sequels to final fantasy 13 i also have them on deck and have never played those either dragon age would be fun to get into uh fallout 3 would be fun to to revisit and play so uh lots of possibilities here on playstation 3 but given that Uh, There's all these big new titles coming out this year. I'm probably going to stick to the really short campaigns and just bust through them on like fun free times that I have to play games. Um, So that is the, uh, the unlock there with the PlayStation three Frankenstein. And I hope to do some more live uh, Twitch streams of me playing various things, especially PS2 and PS1, because that's the glory of this PlayStation three that the launch model is that it's HDMI out and I can easily play PlayStation 1 and 2 games on a modern TV without any modifications or extra cables or any of the other stuff you have to do to get old consoles to work on modern TVs. So that is that. I am PlayStation 3 obsessed. My Frankie is in the house. I'm here. I love it. And my trophies are going to go nuts uh, as I play these old things and like run through old campaigns and fun stuff. I'm loving it. This is all the retro talk and world around PlayStation 3. I think after this long, long journey, I think it's been over three years. I have pictures of getting this PlayStation 3 over three years ago. I have been so, I have put so much mental energy and actual finances towards getting this PlayStation 3 to stay alive, to work, and to be revived forever. I have to, like, I almost feel committed to say that it's my favorite single video game console of all time. And that's coming from a Nintendo fanboy that absolutely adored Nintendo. And Nintendo 64 was probably my favorite console before I'm now starting to shake this. And I'm starting to think, like, this this PlayStation 3 could be my favorite console of all time. Um, it's an, an amazing machine. In fact, there's a book coming out in June. I can't wait for it. I kickstarted it. It's called It Only Does Everything, PlayStation 3. And Colin Moriarty is writing the intro for it, um, or whatever you call the writers that do an intro for a book. Um, I can't wait. It's going to be good. Uh, And that's going to have a whole bunch of cool stuff, stories, tidbits, insider information, ex-developers, people who used to work for Sony, uh, all interviewed, all have their thoughts laid out. It's going to be this cool like hardback book. Uh, I can't wait to add that to my collection of books that I have about video games. And uh, I, think, I think that is it. So I'm going to leave you all with that. Once again, you can find me over at 80bitpodsmash.com, 80bitpodsmash. Uh, I still hope to interview Computer Booter. I've been trying to get him. His words are, I am like a shiny Pokemon. I am hard to catch. So he's super, super busy uh, and holds fast to, I mean, he's doing like 11 to 12 hour streams Monday through Friday. Uh, so his weekends of course are sacred as they should be. Uh, he also works on the weekends too, just not online. So, uh, he's really hard to nail down, but I eventually want to get that interview. I haven't forgotten. It hasn't fallen off the plate and we haven't stopped communicating. I still watch his streams and participate in his madness, uh, over there. So, um, 
be on the lookout for that. So if you want to be aware of when these things happen, please go to our Twitch and YouTube channels and hit the subscribe button. My unboxing of the Frankenstein video is live on YouTube, and you can find a link to that channel over at 80bitpodsmash.com. There's a link tree there with links to all those things. Penguin is still pushing content over on TikTok, so you can go check him out. He's my co-host in trouble. Uh, our little duo, Penguin and Termite. Right now, 80-Bit Pod Smash has taken a really long hiatus, uh, and we hope to be back uh, the next quarters, but some more recent news has come out that might actually jeopardize that too, so we will figure all of that out. Keep you posted, and the best way for you to stay up to date is to subscribe to all of our channels and like keep in touch with us, jump into our Discord server, ask questions, uh, and you can be made aware of those things. And on a whim, if you ever want to play a PlayStation 3 game with me, it would be kind of fun to, like see what servers and how it's still like what are what servers are live does it still even work can i even do it i just don't know anyone that's playing anything on playstation 3 right now that i would play online with so if uh even that suggest it and uh, we'll see what happens and we'll go with that so go check me out there 80bitpodsmash.com and with that i will see you next week 